Hey there, welcome to Supercharge Fridays. If you're joining us from Jonathan's part of the world, good morning. And if you're watching us in the replay, hi there, wherever you are, good afternoon, good evening. I hope you're well, I hope you're safe, relatively speaking, as safe as can be. Welcome to Supercharge Fridays. This is the best part of the week. And if we haven't met before, I'm Sonal, I'm a career coach, I'm in Brussels. And right now we are live on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. So as you can see, I have someone exceptional with me today. He's kind of like LinkedIn royalty. So I'm extremely honored um, that he's here. And I also want to say he's one of my newest friends. So I'm really kicked about that. Uh, please welcome Jonathan in the comments, because I know there's a bit of delay. But if you're joining us, come in and say hi to us in the comments. Don't be shy. Where are you? What time is it? How's it going? How's your week been? Come and say hi in the chat because we're going to get started and then we have a ton of questions for Jonathan. So before we do that, I want to say, Jonathan, uh, properly say very warm welcome and thank you so much. I can't give a response to that, Sanal, that's going to give any justice to who I am. But I will just say thank you. And also, Sanal, I, I just want to hear you talk. I'm, I'm just so captivated by you talking right now that I'm just going to watch. And it's unfortunate <laughs> that I have to be on the show. <laughs> Such a great, I see how you've done 40 of these. You're just, you're so on top of it. This is going to be fun. I'm going to be quiet because you said we have a lot. We have a lot to cover. We have um, a lot to cover. But yes, I, I also want to say. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Sanal. I want to say, yes, uh, Sanal is now one of my new dear friends on LinkedIn, and I'm so excited to have met her and so excited to be on this. And we're going to be collaborating and talking and hanging out. And this is just the start, guys. So uh, so thank you. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. Oh, my, my pleasure. It's, it's a huge uh, honor and privilege that you said yes. And so, Jonathan, for... Uh, I'm going to keep an eye on the comments as well. But uh, for some of the people here who are not familiar with you, before we get deep into all the stuff that we want to talk about, which is young people, mm -hmm. careers, young mm -hmm. is also um, uh, very uh, relative, right? Young can be anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. So before we yeah. start cracking into the, in the topic du jour, perhaps mm -hmm. if you could you know, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit of your juicy details about who is Jonathan Desser, what is he about, and and uh, a little bit of your backstory. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, it feels like an interview question, so I'm gonna answer it like that, and then <laughs> so I'll, let you push, I'll let you push a little bit deeper. But I mean, essentially, you know, I define myself as, as three things. Um, one is I have a day job um, where I'm the VP of research at the New York City Tourism Board. Um, so I'm in charge of understanding who's coming to New York City and, and really understanding more of their identity of who they are and, and, and what they do. Um, so that's my day job. I don't really talk much about it on LinkedIn. I don't think anybody even knows that I do that. But for those who don't, hi, that's, that's how I earn my money. Um, secondly, um, you know, Snell, you, you, you referenced this, but um, I spent a lot of time helping mentoring young professionals. And, and you're right. I mean, there is a there's a definition of that that's unclear. For me, it, it tends to be about 18 to 27 is about the cutoff. And I help them more with the emotional side of what it means to have a career, um, more of the questioning of how does a career fit into your life, um, less of the here's how you make your resume better and tactical stuff and more how, how are you feeling? How is how is work feel? How, how are you feeling in terms of where you're going? And I think that's that's how people primarily know me uh, on LinkedIn, and it's why they follow me. And then third, this is my new I wouldn't call it career, but my new thing is um, I pride myself on my content um, that I release on LinkedIn. Um, it's you know provocative to the point, um, and it's garnered a lot of great attention. And I pride myself on the actual writing of that content. So um, uh, that's me. That's my three parts of who I am. Um, you might see in my title for those who don't know me, career whisperer. And it's a great title that I came up with for myself because it's essentially what I do. I have this ability to tell young people kind of where they should go just on just on the short amount of conversation. It's a skill that I'm, I'm proud of. So that's a little bit about me. 
Okay, okay, that's amazing. I'm so sorry, uh, Jonathan, what's been happening while you, um, I was trying to figure out because normally our comment section is flooded and I don't mean to get into like boring details, but it turns out there is a problem with LinkedIn today and LinkedIn, I'm not live there and that's primarily where the audience is. There is an uh -huh. issue with LinkedIn. There's a tech issue with LinkedIn. So what I'm going to do is I'm going <clears> to <throat> um, uh, put the link on um, from YouTube uh, on LinkedIn so that people aren't missing out because it's a it's a pity um, if they do that uh, because I think that a lot of what you say will will be very helpful to to people on LinkedIn. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, I love that introduction. I love the career whisperer, uh, self proclaimed career whisperer. Because if someone else is not going to say it, go in honor it, <laughs> claim it. It's, it's oh, yeah. Hard. I mean, the funny thing about that is I just put it up as a joke, right? I was like, oh, I'm a career whisperer, ha, ha. And it's kind of stayed with me. It's kind of become my brand. It's this yeah, idea yeah, yeah. that, um, you know, I'm able to kind of whisper in your ear and help you out with some of the more important aspects of your career. So, yeah, I own it. <laughs> and I laugh good at it at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, good, good for you. Good for you. I, I love it. Um, so, great. Say, hey, Jonathan, so... Um, when you talked about LinkedIn and all of that stuff, because LinkedIn itself is quite a journey, right? So mm -hmm. um, I introduced you as someone who's very honest. And is that the way it's always been in the sense that, um, you know, you say your mind uh, no matter what, because people's responses can be so weird, oversensitive, uh, underwhelmed, all kinds of crazy stuff. So how do you, how, has it always been that way? It's how I got famous in the first place. I hate that word famous. I can't believe I just said that. It's how I went viral. Yeah. Um, it's how I. It's how my whole LinkedIn started. Um, I came out with a, an extremely um, uh, controversial post um, about the fact that young professionals, uh, this was back in January, I'm going through my feed and I had already connected with a, a lot of young professionals and I just put out a rant. It was literally a rant post and it was saying, you know, stop with the bragging, stop showing off about yourself. You, you're not doing anyone a favor instead of showing off, you know, why don't you help out your other fellow young professionals now that you've achieved success, tell them how you got to where you are. And, you know, about 4 million views later, here I am. And I'm like, okay, great. I'll, you know, I can just rant on, on LinkedIn and be honest and let's see where this goes. <laughs> and here I am, you know, nine and a half months later, still putting out, pretty provocative kind of content like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, it happened from the start, but I mean, it's an interesting question, Sonal. I think to answer it, you, you have to know where I come from. I, I'm a New Yorker, right? And uh, from New York City, born and raised, still live in the area. And as such, there's no such thing as not being honest. We don't know how to do it. Um, we are blunt, we're to the point, and we want to say how we feel. And, you know, nothing's going to stop us from doing that. And, you know, at the time I had, what, like 10,000 followers? I'm at 80,000 followers. Nothing's changed. I'm still every day coming out with stuff that you're not going to like. Um, and I'm okay with that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that. And uh, thank you for your honesty, because I think it's refreshing and I think it's much needed. So I, I appreciate it. Um, so let's get cracking as far as the topics are concerned, because when it comes to things and figuring out life and all of that stuff, John, um, mm -hmm. we're all kind of putting up a charade sometimes. We don't always know what's going on. We're play, sometimes making things up as we go along. So mm -hmm. just to say that it's only young people who go through that is a bit unfair. Um, but having said that, what are the top two, top three things that you hear a lot? Because I know you're doing a lot of mentoring. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's patterns in there, repeated, no matter what culture they belong to, no matter what gender they have, you know, you see this come up more and more. Because I, I think we can learn from uh, a lot of what you hear and what you share. Yeah. Um, I think that it really comes down to one's identity as a worker um, for young people. Uh, this is particularly for college and grad school professionals, there's really, there's really two ways. They're very insecure, right? And, and they're insecure for an obvious reason. They don't have expertise on anything and they don't have much experience. And there's two ways that they handle this. Um, some of them, like I said, they do these brag posts to show, well, I got this handled. I'm successful. I'm doing great, right? 
That's how some of the young professionals handle this insecurity of not knowing where they're going in the world. But more and more, you know, particularly for my audience, is this vulnerability, this ability to say, I don't know where I'm going and I'm scared. And this is hard. And, you know, how, John, how do I handle this not knowing? How do I handle this imposter syndrome? How do I get over this so that I can present myself and, and get the right footing into the working world? Right. So, you know, it, it really does come down to this idea that lack of experience and and lack of and, and fear of the unknown is driving young people to act in certain ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you do about that fear, John? I um, there, there's a there's a couple of ways to deal with it. Um, one is more tactical, um, and one is more emotional. And I'll walk you through that because I think this is going to be important for your audience to hear. And like you said, this may not be just for young professionals. This can be for anyone. Um, the tactical is 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 the one where I say jump in with two feet and do. And what I mean by that is um, for young people who don't feel like they have the confidence or the self-esteem to go into what they do, I say just do. Get those projects underway. Start those conversations with um, you know older professionals who you want to follow in their footsteps. You know, start doing volunteer projects. Start getting those internships. And now that you get your feet wet, you're going to have that confidence when you go into the world of work to do a good job. Right? That's one side. That's the tactical side to gain confidence. The other side, from an emotional side, is to Embrace and accept the fact that, yeah, you don't feel good about yourself, and that's okay. You don't always have to portray yourself as happy or somebody who has everything under control. You can say, you know what, I am scared about this. I'm not doing well. And, you know, just to be okay with not being okay is, is a big message that I give to young people to take the stress off of this need for success so soon. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. Um, and it's a very different stress, right? I mean, it's not that our parents were not stressed when they were our age, but it wasn't always documented. <laughs> and here it's played out in real time in that sense so in, you know you're you're expected to be on your game all the time which is not fair which is not how it's supposed to be so it's okay to be not okay it's okay to be vulnerable um i think there's a lot of power in there and it needs to be practiced not just said out loud but you know definitely practiced cool yeah yeah sorry you were going to add something no, I mean, I agree. I think it's, that's why I'm saying both of these things are things that you practice, right? You consciously say to yourself, I don't know, and I'm okay with not knowing. And you remind yourself of that and you catch yourself in that, in that thinking, right? And then yes, obviously the practical, tactical stuff of, you know, networking and getting volunteer projects and internships. Yeah, that's that's always something to work on. So it's an action oriented thing, but it's also an acceptance of reality. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, very important. Cool. So you just alluded to it a little bit right now. And, you know, how we approach networking is all very different. I don't think, you know, there's a right way sometimes or a wrong way. It's what works for you. And particularly when someone who's a digital native, right? And um, they may have an approach to networking which works for them, or maybe it doesn't. But when they come to you, John, how do you support them to reach their goals a little bit faster with the power of their network? Um, this, is a, this is an area where I have a very, very strong opinion on. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> even stronger than other areas. Bring it on, um, bring it on. That's why you're and, here. You know, I think this actually, the, the way to answer this is I work in one of the most wonderful networking industries in the world. I work in travel and tourism. And if you work in travel and tourism, and anyone, anyone who's listening to this who works in this field is going to nod and laugh when I say this, they're the best networkers on earth because nothing that they do ever comes across as self-serving. 
you know, this is an industry where hoteliers, you know, who are competing against each other, like, you know, tooth and nail, they get in the same room with each other and they give each other hugs and kisses. And they say, how's your wife? And they care about the answer, right? These, this is, this is my industry where people care about people. The, the tourism industry is all about people and hospitality and making people feel good. And so I'm a natural fit for that. Because my my style of networking in Sanal, we, we had this, you know, as soon as we met, right? And this is something I'm trying to instill in the younger folk is that as soon as you have an agenda with your networking, you've lost the game. You have to, your entire goal with networking is not to get anything out of anyone. It cannot be that. You cannot approach it that way. It has to be... I want to get to know you as a person. I want to get to know what makes you tick. I want to understand the decisions you've made and who you are and how it's led to who you are. And I want you to be seen as a person. And what happens from there is people feel like they're seen as a person. Well, they start doing things for you and you didn't even ask, right? And you now you've got an in because the only thing really that anybody in this world wants is some sort of acceptance of who they are. Yeah. And when you give them that power to feel like you're listening and that yeah. you're accepted and you yeah. embrace them, they're going to go out of their way for you. Now, young professionals, 97%, I'm using big numbers because I work in numbers, right? 97% of them do not do this. Yeah. Do not think this way. No. I have to reach out to alumni who work in what I do and ask them for a job. Ooh, oh God, hey, Sanal, that's just not going to work. It's and that's nerve wracking. No, it's, it's nerve wracking. And, and moreover, um, I love what you said. Don't have an agenda. Just don't. Never. You do want something. We're not being naive here. Obviously, you want something. You're reaching out to a recruiter. Yeah, you want a job. You're reaching out to an alumni. Yeah, you want a job. That's okay. But don't lead with that. That's what you're saying, right? There's a classy way to do things, and there's a cheap. Um, uh, I, 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 I still, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. I actually disagree with you. I don't think there's an agenda. I mean, with a recruiter, there is. Within an alumni, you know, you can just learn. And the goal isn't to get a job from them. The goal is just to see what they want to do for you. And you can ask at the end. And there's no expectation that they're going to do anything for you. Yeah. Uh, this is again like this is this is why I'm fairly extreme on this. I don't I, I, let me like I can give you an example of this, right? So I talked about this uh, on my LinkedIn when the last I've lost my job three times, right? I've had three different um, three different periods of unemployment, and the third time I was laid off. All I did was I, I literally went on eight networking calls, like and not calls at this time it was coffee chats and lunches. And I just got in touch with my network and I just said, what's going on with you? And that was it. It was yeah. just catching up. It was catching right. up with zero agenda that they were going right. to give me anything. And from those eight calls a week, I my business was snowballing and opportunities were snowballing just because I showed that I cared and I'm showing up and I'm hearing about your life. There's no agenda there. That's I think that's a that's just I, don't, I wouldn't call it a point of contention, but I think it's an important addendum to that, that, you know, to approach with some sort of ulterior motive that something's going to happen is is going to lead to disappointment and it's going to come across. Yeah, <clears throat> no, absolutely. Uh, and um, as well in Buddhism as well, they say expectations reduce joy. So um, I love that. And, and I, right. um, I kind of agree. I mean, I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. I think what I said didn't necessarily come out right. But what I meant is you're, for example, very actively job hunting. And you're reaching out. Obviously, eventually, the outcome that you desire is that this results in something that results in something, and it snowballs in a in a positive way. Um, I'm going to jump into the comments, and I feel really bad because if we'd been live on LinkedIn, there'd be so much chatter. But I'm so grateful to the people who are here because you guys are rocking. How are you, Lauren? Expect nothing, no ulterior motives. I love that. That's how your friendship started as well. And uh, it's it's extremely relevant, but very difficult that people don't practice it, right? Now, that's what you said, um, John. It's like 97% of the people. It's not how we are wired. And Risto, who's a coach, 
friend in Finland. He talks about the Ritz Carlton mantra, which probably you know, John, if you're coming from hospitality, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. serving ladies and gentlemen, that's what we do. We care about people. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. This yeah, story. that's awesome, Risto. I mean, because yeah. it really is the mantra of the industry and people who get into it, they really live by it. And it, it yeah. really warms my heart because I didn't realize that this was a way that people, I was thought I was weird that I'm the one doing this, but it is a mantra in the industry for sure. That's really great. Yeah. No, and it's a great mantra as well to have in other industries. It doesn't have to be only the thing that, you know, hospitality is known for. It's not fair. Why not share that? You know, <laughs> it's, it's a great stuff. I wish, I wish that it was shared across industries. I just haven't found it to be the case. Yeah. Yeah, I totally understand that. Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit already, John. Talk to us about specific other mistakes mm. that you see young people making, uh, particularly now at the start of their career. Now, we could be some of us watching who are young. Or, again, it's a definition. I don't like um, labels. But let's mm -hmm. say starting the career, right? Yeah, start. Um, career starts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be uh, particularly there. And you see this happening a lot, mm -hmm. um, except for the other stuff that we already talked about. Let's learn a little bit what not to do. Yeah, I, I love this question. Thank you so much. I, surprisingly, I haven't gotten this, but it's a wonderful question and I, I have a definite answer to it. The common yes. mistake that young people make is to feel the peer pressure around them to do something that they don't want to do. They fight themselves. It's like fighting against a current, right? They're swimming upstream thinking that they want to do something when they know deep down that they don't. And what I mean by that, and that's why I love this question, is they're not really thinking about what they want. They're seeing what their peers are doing and they're saying, that's what I want. And so the most common mistake that they don't do is what I call this, this idea of self-awareness training, where you sit and you understand who you are and you think about that and you're like, what do I like? What are my hobbies? How do I interact with the world? What are some of my my favorite academic, right? This is the stuff I do with career whispering. And then how does that relay into a career? What was my major? What were the internships? How do I take my experience of being me and bring that into the world? They don't do that. Young people are like, well, you know what? There's finance companies and consultant companies and accounting companies. And my parents told me this and there's societal pressure to do this. And I have to make a lot of money and this, they're making the wrong decisions on their careers very early on based on expectations and peer pressure rather than an, an exploration into themselves. Mm -hmm. And almost all career mistakes that are made are because of this, this yeah. lack of this lack of understanding of who you are and where you really want to go um, to the detriment of, you know, your parents potentially being disappointed in that or your peers laughing at you, or, you know, this, it's tough. I'm not saying what I'm saying is easy, but I think it's the number one mistake I see. Yeah, no, I love that you shared that because I um, had a very interesting experience when I graduated with my MBA. I was, I wouldn't say I was starting my career. I had been working for about seven years, but still, you know, young, uh, 28, 29. And I graduated in the middle of this recession of 2008, 2009. Uh, mm -hmm which I always think was a, a horrible time to graduate. But of course, now we're in 2020. It's um, 2020 has taken the cake and the bakery. <laughs> it's a whole different mm -hmm. level of uh, crap storm. Uh, and I uh, very detailed, I wrote an article on Thrive Global on how in spite of so many obstacles, um, you know, being in Europe, not having work permit, no, not having a network, et cetera, I, I graduated with five job offers, which is unthinkable and people don't agree with it. And I wrote how I did it. And the first thing I wrote in that article was don't follow the herd. So what you're saying, uh, I can relate to it so much because that particular school from where I graduated is known for feeding the McKinsey's mm -hmm. and the Boo's and the BCG's of the world. There's nothing wrong with it. But if that's not what you want to do or it's not what you're good at, then carve your own. It takes a little bit longer, but you'll be found eventually um, if you're really good at what you do and you're, the passion is very clear as well. Mm -hmm. um, you're not sort of in it just for the, you know, some, you know, the the outward uh, glory, because intention matters. Mm -hmm. 
That's exactly right. And, you know, it's easy to follow, like follow your North star when you know that you're doing it for yourself, yeah. right? It becomes a lot easier to, you know, cause you're going to get all that pressure from everybody to do all this, right. To yeah. go and be in BCG or some tech yeah. firm. Right. And yeah. people are going to say, well, what's wrong with this guy? Why does he want to do this? And it's like, well, I know why. And yeah. you can't, say anything because I did the work and you didn't. Yeah. So maybe Absolutely. you should look inside yourself too. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's always, it's so funny, um, John, because uh, everybody's toxic. There's always a problem. It's the other person's problem. Uh, I have a bad boss. So my boss is bad. What about what's going on here? Like mm -hmm. we're very good at pointing the finger that guy is a racist that i'm not going to get into all of that but it's always outside the problem is always outside that's not possible <laughs> we have to look at the mirror sometimes it's not going to be very immature way of looking at the world if you think that if you think that external circumstances have that much of an effect on you you're going to live a victim mentality and you're going to get bitter when you start taking responsibility for the things coming at you and you say, how, how much of this can I deal with and how much of this is their problem? And you do the hard cognitive work. And that's to hard. Get to it. yeah. It's hard. Oh, it's, it's hard, hard. Which, is why, which is why a lot of us don't do it. And um, uh, I heard somebody else say this, the trigger is always the teacher. And before we pressed live, um, John and I were talking and there's some stuff going on on LinkedIn. Why is this stuff triggering some people? It's so interesting. It's like, okay, what, you know, why, why are you so sensitive? There's something going on. So it's not only like, okay, John said something and it ticked somebody off. It's not about John. It's about the person who's got ticked off. We, we shouldn't, <clears throat> uh, we shouldn't forget to take accountability for that. Um, yeah. I'm and I think. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I do want to actually I do want to actually address that. So on my LinkedIn account, I'm very, very careful not to get into arguments with people, right? They have opinions, they're expressing themselves, they're saying, John, I hate you. Like, here's my personal story, you're insensitive. Those things are fine, right? Go ahead, right? As soon as you invalidate how I feel, I will push back on you. Right. This is a this is part of my code of honor of commenting, because if I put something vulnerable out, you don't have the right to tell me that what I said isn't valid. Mm. Right. Because it's it's about me and it's about mm. something subjective about myself and it's about how I feel. And if you're going to come and say, get over it or you're going to yeah. use some sort of insensitive phrase yeah. about how I'm presenting, how I feel. I will go in the comments and I will call you out on it because I think it's actually important for my audience to see that, that it's not okay to invalidate anyone's experience, right? You can say, I feel like on LinkedIn, right? If you wanted to go and you say, I worship the sheep God of Sithalu and I love him dearly and he has made my life incredible, right? If you go and you invalidate that person's experience around the god Sithalu, you're the bad person there because the person writing this is talking passionately about something that matters to them. You're not being sensitive to who they are and what they're expressing. And this is a code of, of honor that I have now that if someone says something where, where the, the sentiment is, John, John, get over it, I go into the comments and I say, that was insensitive, right? Yeah. And that happened this morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I totally get that. And it's, um, there's one thing which is politically correct. And there's another thing which is complete censoring, because I don't agree with you. So it's so, sort of the world we're living in today. But I also want to quickly shout out and say hi in the comments, because you guys are here in spite of the tech issues we've had on LinkedIn. And I really appreciate that you're here. Greg, Ilmi, Heba, uh, Lauren, lovely to see you. Risto has something else to say, this dear friend of mine, <clears throat> who was also on the live stream a couple of uh, months ago. Uh, so the attribution error is so common. All the good is because of me. All the bad is from the others. And I can remember my experience because he worked a lot with the at-risk youth as well. And mm -hmm. a positive decision was something I could do. A rejection wasn't passive. It cannot be. Oh, that's so interesting. The language that we also use uh, plays a big role. And that's very unconscious, right? We don't think about it. It just happens mm -hmm. that way. It's yeah, actually. 
uh, I gotta, Risto, we gotta, we gotta hang out because you gotta, you gotta connect. Actually have, fact, um, all of you guys have to connect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're gonna, we gotta hang out. <laughs> I gotta hang, I gotta answer this, Risto, because I love this. I'm actually gonna put a post out that's gonna piss a lot of people off related to this idea. And this is, you know, I'm gonna use young people as an example, but the post that I'm putting out is um, essentially when I say something really nice about young people, right? Like I have a post about how, you know, resilient and how mature um, international students are for studying abroad, right? And the response from young people is, oh my God, that's so me. Wow, that really captures who I am. But if I call a young person out, right? And I say, your networking style is kind of selfish. You're not thinking of others. How many, what, what, how many of those young people then get back to me and say, wow, that's so me, John. Wow, you really captured me, right? I think that that's kind of what you're saying, Risto, is that people take the good about themselves and, and really identify with that. But if you because call them out on something, yeah. Yeah. And they have something to work on. No, that's not me, right? It's this attribution error that you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. I think I agree with that, and it's, yeah. it's something yeah. I think about a lot. Uh, no, it's it's a uh, uh, as long as it's praise, it's good. As, if there's criticism in there and it's pointed, and what I like is, um, John, you don't say, "Hey, I think your networking style needs a little bit of work." You're not giving a neutral statement. If you say your networking style is coming up across as a little bit selfish. You're using direct words, mm -hmm. right? And some people, if they've been mm -hmm. brought up mm -hmm. by their mom and dad as, you know, being coddled, uh, you got a medal for just showing up. <laughs> I'm not going to get into all that. But mm -hmm. it's that entitlement thing, right? And suddenly you come out in the real world and somebody says you're selfish. And you're like, how dare mm -hmm. you? <laughs> you know, it's not mm -hmm. used to that. But it's true. I'm just saying that you are being selfish and I'm using myself as an example. I'm not calling you selfish. I'm saying your actions are selfish. Your That's the difference, the right? Yeah. Your yeah. behavior yeah, yeah, yeah. is coming across as self-involved. Are you a right. selfish person? We're all selfish people. No, no, no. I don't I'm mean, yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you yeah. mean, but it's also selective listening, right? On, on the other person's side. So it's, it's a, yeah. it's a very valid point. They um, hate this message. They hate it. Yeah. You, ha you hate what? No, no, they don't respond well to that. They're like, mm. Mm, I don't like that. That doesn't make me feel good. I'm uncomfortable. But my job, mm. as I always say at LinkedIn, is to make you uncomfortable and make you think, hmm, maybe there's a better way to do something. Yeah, you know, and the other very good thing is that what we're talking about, I don't think people talk about this type of stuff a lot. And maybe we're going in a slightly different tangent, but I think it's very applicable, not only to young people. I see this uh, block, um, report block. Anybody who doesn't agree with me or said even one line that I don't agree with, I'm going to report them and block them. Do what you got to do. Nobody's going to tell you any different. But think about that. Yeah. If, <clears throat> if, if everything around us is ticking us off, what's going on? What's going on? Something is going on. And we, we, I've said this before, we can't keep using COVID as an excuse for weird behavior. Yeah, I think that, you know, anytime, and I wrote a post about this yesterday, I'm like, anger is a great lesson for us, right? Anytime we get angry about something, it's the one of the most value, and Buddhism, this is the core tenet of Buddhism, right? Anytime you get angry, it's a great learning lesson about yourself. Yeah. It's a way to give self-compassion to yourself and to others. And I think yeah. that's kind of what you're talking about, which is this idea that something happens and how do we respond to it and how do we take responsibility for it is so important. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. I'm going to jump into the chatter. Hi, Maruti. Uh, he was sending me messages while you were talking, like, where is the live stream? Uh, in the corporate world, there are instances where you just, you know, you would find people say, hey, everything's good because of, me. oh, yeah, I mean, that's the that's taking credit, right? And it's a norm. It's been like this forever. But I think people are finally starting to smell the BS <laughs> and calling people out. It's still a way to go. And I, I think Maruti, in certain cultures, we still have that hero worship thing where the boss can, you know, the CEO can do no wrong. Uh, but people are starting to have, you know, find more courage to write about all this stuff out. Uh, I'm not saying it's perfect, uh, but it's the first steps I think have already been taken. 
Um, so the ethics of competition, it's no longer uh, about becoming taller and growing. It's about cutting the other. Yeah, yeah, that, that's Gary V says that. I love it because he, he talks about uh, you can either big, build the biggest building or you can uh, um, cut up other people's buildings because you're like, I'm taller, I'm better. Um, which is <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a whole... Market. It's a whole other conversation. The, the people who do that feel very small inside and they haven't done any, you know, any work on themselves to realize that they're the problem. Yeah. Um, and you do, you know, this, this is unfortunate realities and small, and I talked about this in our first chat. It's the unfortunate reality of most corporate environments where it's every shark for themselves and cutting someone down is a good thing because it necessarily means that you can raise yourself. And I see it all the time, but it's, you know, how much of that can you do and maintain the sense of, you know, adding to humanity and being a good person. Those are the questions you don't see asked enough. <clears throat> no, no, absolutely. I totally agree with you. Um, I'm going to get into the next one, but I quickly want to see what Risto is saying because Risto has been busy typing. We also learned in social work that feedback, giving feedback in a was a positive in a positive connotation is more easily accepted. Uh, no negative or indifferent tone. We hear uh, refers to uh, colleagues who paid research about this. Ah, yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, there's an art, definitely. There's an art to giving feedback that will be accepted, which will at least resonate with the other person. Um, <clears throat> so, um, looking at what's been going on in the world of work now, employment, jobs, lots of stuff has changed. I think there are jobs in 2020 that didn't exist maybe even 10 years ago, right? Or even five years ago. I don't know if you have like this glass, you know, crystal ball, and you're looking around what's going on with your research and your insights and all your data. Do you have any views on maybe some exciting new jobs that might be coming up so that people who are watching, who are maybe studying right now or have just started working, that they can gear themselves towards them? Oh, it's a tough question. Um, I can really only speak about the data field and what I think is exciting um, and <clears throat> what the data field needs more of. I think four to five is, is going to be very hard for me because, again, I work mostly in data and mostly in marketing. So I'm not I can't mm -hmm. really speak to a lot of other fields. But what I can speak for is this idea that in data um, we need people with people skills and we need people who can. Um, take the stuff that's being done by the coders and speak to it with a, telling stories and get people to listen and essentially influence, you know, in some positive way. Um, that's the, the, the key here is, is the emotional intelligence side yes. of data yes. is where yeah. if you want to get into data and you want to have a successful career and you want to climb a ladder and you want to earn lots of money, the focus needs to now be less on how do I create a Python script for this? Cause you can hire someone for $5 an hour and, you yeah. know, Bangladesh for that. And the focus needs to be switched to how do how do I take whatever is being, how do I turn, how do I spin this raw data into gold? And how do I, how do I essentially, um, you know, become the person who can translate this for people who literally hate, data. I mean, this is the thing people don't understand about data is that in an organization, you know, we talk about data, we think people are rational and, and they're not. Data is an, an inherently emotional thing. And so if you have the ability to understand that and to empathize with people who are scared of data, you are now a hero to a corporation because you're taking something that people are scared of, that's rational, that that's, you know, going to make them lose their job and all these things, right? And you are now the hero who is able to comfort them and say, no, I'm going to use this data to work with you, not against you. And so this idea that, you know, these kinds of emotional intelligence skills and leadership skills within my world of data, that's where the focus needs to be more on than mm -hmm. it is currently. 
How do you mm. become the master storyteller? How do you take the insights, right? How do you find them from the stuff that the coders are putting out? Mm. And there's not a lot of there's not a lot of emphasis on this. The emphasis is on how do I use the right technique? Well, the right technique doesn't matter if you can't capture somebody's attention who's not comfortable with data. And as yeah. I said, I don't think most people in corporations are comfortable with data. So yeah. the focus yeah. in my field really needs to move towards this idea that you need to learn how to tell these stories and you need to work on these kind of skills because it's going to set you up for success. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm seeing that Lauren said something. Uh, we don't look for help um, because it's so debased in corporate America. I found that when there's lip service and and then we say we care, but what we really care about is metrics and, and data. And yes, Heba, we definitely need more storytellers, but talk to us about, I'm, I want to rewind a little bit about what you said, John. People are scared of data and data can be very emotional. Um, the first one I've heard of, data can be very emotional. This one I've heard of. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, I actually have a post about this uh, uh -huh. coming out. Um, Data is emotional. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, you're a marketing manager and um, somebody's about to put something out that says that your campaign sucked. I'm just using that word sucked to like really get the point home, right? Now data becomes emotional because you are fight or flight, right? You're, you've got an amygdala response to that because someone, this data analyst is your enemy now. They're going to put something out that says you're not doing your job right. And your automatic response is, this data person's gonna make me lose my job. This is emotional. This is not rational. That is not a rational response, right? A rational response, Sonal, would be, oh, okay, you know what? I have some things that I need to work on. I'm gonna look at this data, I'm gonna improve on it. Do you think that's how most people respond when they hear they're not doing something well? No, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna go at you. And I've because been doing data you, for hmm? Yeah, sorry, because you're you're if you make a statement like that, for example, your data sucks, then there's something in my primitive brain which wants to defend me uh, because I view it as an attack. And then obviously there's fight or flight, like you said. Yeah, right? but it's not me saying it, it's the data saying it. The data literally is telling you sure. your performance is down twenty percent yeah. year over year. Yeah. Go explain yeah. yourself and your amygdala is like ah 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 panic, right? He's That's a yeah, exactly. Yes, that's, that's emotional. Emotion. Yeah. Data is emotional. And we tend to think, well, because it's numbers and it's truth and it's this or that, it's not emotional. In a corporate it's setting, emotion. yeah. it's 90% emotional and 10%, well, I can rationally think about this. Yeah. But people have this wonderful ability of layering on rationale and storytelling on top of some deep-seated emotions. And so my point here with data is it's, it's threatening. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, a skill which we need more and more of. And in fact, we had someone two weeks ago talk about emotional intelligence. And it is a huge need right now, not just for young people, but across the board. And also using emotional intelligence in data in insights, um, storytelling, like Hiba said, but real storytelling, not corporate uh, hogwash, you know, uh, type mm -hmm. of stuff. So absolutely love that. And Maruti is asking, you know, in the tech world, Product-led growth is the latest trend. So a product would market itself and sell itself. So your thoughts on marketing and sales, because this is one area you you um, you know you may have something to say here. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, this is not something I agree with mm -hmm. at all. Sorry, I mean, that's good, and I want one, this to I'm be thinking one way. exception, right? I'm thinking Tesla. That's the only exception I can think of. Tesla is the only thing that it sells itself. Everything else, yeah. this is. Uh, absolutely could not disagree more with this. Um, okay. The need for marketing and salespeople in tech world is more important than ever. Um, especially, you know, I'm thinking of ad tech, right? I worked in mm -hmm. advertising technology and you had all these solutions that essentially seemed like the same thing. And it can't just be advertising technology. It's a lot of different solutions where, you know, you're going to show you have certain features. No one's going to care. You have to have a salesperson who's nurturing that relationship to say, okay, well, yeah, our products are similar, but look, I'm taking you out for a beer. And again, it gets back to this idea, Dr. Maruti, of 
people are making decisions emotionally, not rationally. In a rational world, yeah, product-led growth where the product is the best and everyone knows it, yeah, everybody would buy that product, but we are not inherently rational creatures. We are led by our emotions. So we're going to be affected by that salesperson who says, I'm going to take you out for a beer. We're going to go to the Brooklyn Nets game. You're affected by that marketing that says this product is going to get you, you know, five rungs up the ladder if you buy it. That's an emotional plea. That's not even about the product. And so, yeah, you got to build a good product, but... I inherently disagree that marketing and sales folks, these products do not sell themselves. You marketing and sales them. folks right. have to tap into those emotions of the buyer in, in deep ways in order to yeah, affect the sales. Yep. Yeah, perfectly. Uh, Maruti, hopefully that's given you some food for thought. Uh, and of course, this is this is John's opinion, right? You'll have different um, opinions on it, but um, uh, it's very interesting nevertheless. So John, I'm um, going to get a little bit personal now. Uh, we talked about, that's one thing, by the way, you don't know that we have in common. And that is, we. is, I've also been without a job three times and it's been such a fantastic learning. I wouldn't trade it for anything. It wasn't easy, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. Talk to us about lessons from your career, right? We're talking about mistakes mm -hmm. that young people are making, mistakes everybody's making on LinkedIn. Talk about some lessons that you wish someone had told you 20 years ago. Oh my God, this is going to be really raw and vulnerable. So here we go. Um, I think that Sanal knew that that was going to happen. Uh, I'm going to go with lesson one about a huge mistake that I've made throughout my career um, that I've corrected for. Um, it's uh, a corporation um, is going to run a certain way and you can't change it. And what I mean by that is you have to work within the realm of your job, right? You, you are, you're, you're assigned a certain job and you have to do that job. And if you, you toe the line too much or you try to innovate too much, or you're what I call myself a maverick, mm -hmm you're going to get punished. The system is going to, you know, it's essentially the system's going to want to get rid of you. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I've had to learn in my career is to play within the lines of what's expected. I hate mm -hmm. saying it. I'm not a mm -hmm. player within the lines. But 20 years of not playing within the lines has meant a lot of anguish and heartbreak and all of that. And playing within the lines also means doing as you're told by your boss. Your boss is your is the person who has complete power over you. They can fire you and they can make your life hell and they can cause you grief. And so a lot of what you need to do and realize is that instead of fighting the power and going against it, you have to embrace it and say, what can I do for my boss? I, it makes me feel awful because I don't want to be in a powerless situation, right? I'm a, I'm a powerful guy, I'm an individual, right? But you're yeah. not. You are, you are unfortunately at the disposal of your boss and at your company. And you have to play within those lines. This is not things I want to say. But after 20 years of experience, this is really the lesson that I've learned. Um, that's why I said this is kind of a vulnerable thing, because it took me a long time to learn this, that I have to play the rules according to what the rules say. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that wasn't easy. I want to say, bravo. It takes courage to, to say something you don't want to say, but you do realize, damn, it would have been a little bit different 20 years ago if I'd known this more, you know, the way I know it now. So hold that thought because <laughs> we're getting a little bit shaken and stirred here. Lauren's like, but what if they want to shake it up? They want then you're doing what your boss, then you're doing what your boss says and you go and shake it up. And your boss is responsible then if you don't, if your boss doesn't, if your, your boss is responsible, if they say, John, we're hiring you to shake it up, you do what your boss says and you shake it up. Right. But if they're not saying that to you, you can't do it. That's no. a tough lesson. That's a tough lesson. And I think there's a, a very strong power in knowing the difference because uh, Lauren, what you said, it's still, it's still coloring in the lines. If you've been told to do it that way, it's still following orders and, right. and making sure you know, making sure you keep people happy as, as far as possible. So uh, I love that you shared mm -hmm. that. 
Yeah, Risto, Risto says the same thing. Don't go against the hierarchy. It's like That's basically right. yeah, you're, you're um, you know shooting yourself in the foot, bashing your head against the wall. It sounds yeah, very I violent. Agree. It sounds violent, but it's 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 true. Speaking of violence, yes, it is a slippery slope. <laughs> I totally agree with you there. Um, but what I think else, that this is yeah. No, um, go ahead. What else? Did, I think that this is some. This is the reason people don't like working in corporate culture, right? Because they don't want to feel that way. They want to feel empowered. They want to feel like they're an individual. They want, they don't like hierarchy. And, you know, we all, there's a lot of mature people saying very mature things on this conversation, but we don't like doing that. Right. I'm not, I'm sure I'm not the only one. No. Um, no. Sorry. What was, what was your next no, that, question? No, no, it, it's good. I, I want to keep continuing. I, I don't want to um, just go with questions all the time because I, I want to see how things yeah, go. We have we got 10 more we, minutes. We, yeah, we have a few more minutes. But Hiva also says, can you still do it, John, without challenging your boss, though? Do what? Um, do what you want to do. Go against the hierarchy or color outside the lines. Oh, whatever. Yeah. That's actually a great... I think that's a great question, and there are ways to do it. It's called, it's called advanced politicking. And you have to be real careful because it can bite you. It can really bite you, but there are ways to go against the grain and to innovate. Um, but it's consensus building and it's, you know, making sure that the right egos are, you know, scratched. Yeah. And it's yeah. all this stuff that we don't talk about because it makes no. us feel evil and icky and bad. It, but if you yeah. want to go against the grain, you have to figure out this way of how do I build up consensus within an organization so that I can get the agenda that I want done right and if your boss doesn't agree with it good luck with that because that's yeah. not gonna fly <laughs> no i i love that you said that because there is a very uh fine line here and and hiba there's uh, people call it what you people call it everything you call it politics ego management ego massage perception management um stakeholder management you can call it whatever you want at the end of the day we're talking about this this is what we're talking about uh and even job descriptions will say excellent communication and stakeholder management skills but that's not what they mean what they mean is this can you keep people happy and still be a little bit of a rebel where we want you to be and not uh, take people off the wrong way it's not uh easy and the reason john and i you and i are talking about it it's not easy which is why so many people don't do it they prefer to like i'm done you know i, I want to leave there's nothing yeah, wrong with why do you think, yeah why do you think i'm on linkedin spouting my truth every day because i need to spout my truth every day i, I it's part of who i am i have to tell you how i feel i i have to be honest with you can you do that in a corporate setting absolutely not I can't no. do this at my job. My job is 100%, like you said, ego and stakeholder management. That is it. That is 100% what I'm paid to do. And so I do it. I toe within those lines. Particularly, <laughs> Hiva, I think um, the higher you go up, I think I saw your profile yesterday, but the high, the long, the more you work now, you have more, the high, you will be expected to know all of this perception management, ego management, all of that stuff. So, I'm glad we talked about that because the earlier you know this, the better for you and for your career. Uh, anything else, John, in terms of lessons that you are reflecting back on? Yeah, um, you know, we think we have these straight and narrow paths to success and life just kind of, you're, you're more of a ping pong ball than you think you are. You don't have control. People want to think, I've got control. You know what you have control over? If you're a doctor, you have control. Right. You, you know that there's a strict path to becoming a doctor and then you become a doctor and you do a doctor. Most careers are not like that. Um, there's there's this ping pong effect of I was doing this and then I'm doing this. and then You got to embrace the chaos of what yeah. a career is um, to such a degree that you're okay with the ping pong ball move in this way and that way. And, and you figure it out as you go along. Everybody's like, you know, Sanal said, everybody's winging it. We're all winging yeah. it every day. Yeah. No one knows what they're doing. Anybody who says otherwise is lying to you. So like, as soon as you embrace the chaos and you're just like, yeah, okay. Every day's new. Let's see what happens it makes you again less stressed and more confident that you can just go and face whatever it is that you have to face <clears throat> absolutely and and embracing the chaos um how 
how would you say that to 15 jonathan 15 years ago to yourself how, how would, would would it would it happen a little bit different for you i don't think jonathan 15 years ago would have accepted that mm. he would have fought it he would have fought it he would have fought it these are these are lessons these are wisdom lessons that mm. you get from life jonathan mm. 15 years ago would have been like no i have complete control over my destiny i'm gonna go get my mba i know what i need to do the straight and narrow path is i'm following it and i'm gonna be successful and i was for a while and then life gets in the way and yeah. you know um i don't think i would have been very open to this lesson from john you know 15 years later no i th i think what we are witnessing here i don't know if you're watching us live or the replay whenever this is extremely powerful we're talking about the power of self awareness and to have the humility to say i wouldn't have done this 15 years ago i was in a totally different place or as opposed to you know saying whatever looks right sounds right i hope i didn't rub you the wrong way um this takes practice right i mean um, you, you can be called by anybody for example i can be called rough around the edges doesn't matter it's you it's who you are there's only one you uh, but the self awareness that you it's beautiful for me it's it's a, it's it's everything so thank you for for it's, shedding some light on that and i'm glad you said that's not and i know that you're not just saying it to make me feel good, but it does make me feel good. It's the best compliment you can give me because this self-awareness that you're all seeing portrayed here uh, on LinkedIn and in this conversation with Sanal, this is, this is a lot of practice and a lot of work to get to the place where I can talk to you honestly about things where I'm not scared of, I'm not scared of your reaction and I'm not scared of what's gonna happen because I've worked through all of this on my own. Yeah. And it's a yeah. lot of work. And it's why I preach that everyone should go in this direction. Yeah. I would love we would have a better world if people were just honest and did the hard work that said, I can reflect honestly about this. I am a mixture of light and dark. I'm not just great and not everybody else is bad. That's essentially the thing that I'm trying to portray in these conversations. Yeah. And I thank no, you again. That's really a very touching thing for you to say to me. I appreciate you're, it. You're very welcome. It was uh, from the heart, like with all compliments. If it's not from the heart, please don't say it. Don't uh, say to it. Anyone, yeah. Don't say it. It's, it's, it's going to, people can smell the BS. But I love what you said there because any place we want to really go to, any place that's worth going to, there are no shortcuts. So including the inner work, there's a ton of self-help books. You can do it that way. You can do podcasts or you can just do it on your own. You don't have to hire a coach. The point is you got to do it to such an extent that when you say something and somebody disagrees with you, you still like yourself. You're like, oh, no problem. I'm OK. And criticisms galore. Of course, it stings. We're human. How can it not sting? But it will be like that, you know, that duck. Have you seen the back of a duck? It's so mm -hmm. smooth. It's like mm -hmm. water off a duck's back. It's like it's come, it's slide right out. So that's what we want, right? Eventually, that's what we want. We want to be there. We're happy with who we are. We love who we are. Uh, we're not conditional. I will like myself a little bit better once I complete my 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 MD or, you know, let me just get that job. Let me just lose 20 pounds more. No, it's fine. It's fine. I'll get there. I'll be fine. But I'm happy with the way I am right now. That's very deep self-awareness. So fabulous. Um, John, um, so what are you working on? What can, what can people expect in the next few days or weeks? Are you working on some interesting projects? Can we talk about it? I'd like to give a little bit of a plug here. <laughs> Uh, gosh, this is this is my problem. Uh, it's not. We, we might have talked about this the first time. Um, you know, everybody has goals. Everybody has things they do. I I, I don't really have any. <laughs> no, <laughs> just, uh, that's I fine. That's I fine. I am winging every day. I don't really know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not really sure. I'm hoping some divine being will tell me what my next step is but yeah i i the journey for me is the de you know is, is the destination i just could go on the journey and i step forward and and i learn and i don't have anything to plug specifically because of that um for me conversations like this with so many intelligent people um weighing in and this is how i learn and this is how i grow this yeah. is this is 
this is really incredible stuff. And I really do hope people watch this hour that we had together, even though it wasn't available on, on the, um, on the live. Yeah, but I'm going to, I'm going to paste the, the link on, um, from Facebook to, um, to LinkedIn. Uh, and what you just said, but that's fine. I mean, uh, honestly, I, I know you're doing a lot of work, but if you don't, I highly recommend that you go and follow, uh, Jonathan Tesser on LinkedIn. If you want a little bit refreshing and honest stuff that you don't see anywhere else, I can guarantee you that you're not going to be disappointed. So having said that, I want to say a thank you to the folks who did find us on uh, Facebook and YouTube. You guys are hugely appreciated. You have no idea. I'm not saying that John and I wouldn't have had fun without you. Of course we would, but it's not the same, right? And at the end of the day, it's about engagement and interaction. And these questions were so brilliant all of them, every single one of them. So hugely appreciative of you guys. And John, I want to say thank you so much for your time today. I know that it was busy for you. I'd like lots of hearts and hearts and likes and loves for loves. <laughs> For John, it's a uh, middle of the, you know, it's the working day. He's got homeschooling. He's got uh, the chaos of modern life. And he's got a full-time job, by the way. He's got a regular nine to five. So he's taken out time for us. So I want to say a huge, huge thank you so, so much. Thanks, everybody. This was uh, this was fantastic. And Sanal, you're, you're a wonderful host and, and you're great at this. So thank you for, for having me. My pleasure. <laughs> Bye, guys. Take care. Have a great weekend.